All right, if you take your Bible this morning, turn over to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I had an opportunity this past week. My wife and I went to uh, Walkertown, North Carolina. We were able to participate, or be a, I wasn't preaching. I was in just enjoying the conference there at the Sword of the Lord, National Sword of the Lord Conference. I think we listened to 15 messages, so it was really good. It was stirring. Uh, one thing that was a side note, and I know uh, a couple of my folks will be very interested to know this, because we've only been in this building now for just a little over a year, and had relatively few problems with the sound, at least from your perspective, but we do have a few little things that come up here and there. But this church at Walkertown, it's been there a long time. I'm sure they've got state-of-the-art equipment, and every night they had problem with the sound. And so, I mean, one of the preachers even accused the sound people as not even going to heaven. I mean, he said they just, <laughs> I mean, it, it was, a, it was a, a sort of a nuisance in a way, but it does happen. And so we know from time to time that takes place. But we are thankful that our sound works as well as it does. And for the folks who run it for us, we're certainly thankful for the help they give there. As you find your place in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, I want to read here a portion of this chapter and hopefully pull out a practical principle that will uh, directly help us today. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll read. Lord, we thank you today for the opportunity to be in this service. Lord, to think that we would open up this book and that the Spirit of God could take the truth and challenge us in such a way that would change our lives. There could be some today that do not know the Lord Jesus that could see their need of a Savior. For believers today to take a spiritual step, to draw closer to you, to be more effective in their life. Lord, put your hand on us this morning, meet with us in a special way, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll notice down as Paul is writing back to this church that he well knew, and of course he had been instrumental in beginning, as he's one of the first places that he went and reached these folks and started a church, and he goes back and begins to give a little bit of his testimony, reminisces and so forth in verse 10. He says, ye are witnesses, and God also how holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. That is, that was their goal. They had reached these people and they themselves tried to maintain their testimony, Paul and his company. And he says, our goal was to get you, after you knew Christ, to walk with God. He says in verse 13, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the church of God, which is in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. You know, Paul is looking back on this church and, of course, writing this letter under inspiration of God. And in doing that, the Spirit of God directs him to remind these people of his ministry there. And as he looks back, he several times in this uh, letter in 1 Thessalonians mentions to them his time there and how he remembers it. In the first chapter, he sort of reminds them, he says, boy, I thank God for this church because everything I've heard about you, you're a healthy church. They were looking for Jesus to come. They were in the work of faith and the labor of love and so forth. In the earlier part of this chapter, he thanks God because he says, I know your church is moving forward. Though it's persecuted, it is producing fruit. It's a fruitful church. But then he also reminds them here, he says, but really this is the, this is the central, the main, the foundation. He says, I remember when we were there, when we spoke, you recognize that as apostles, we weren't giving you our opinion. You recognize that what we said was not just religious exhortation, but rather you received what you heard as it is in truth, the word of God. Now, you know, there's a lot of ways you can classify a church. Some people may go in a church and they may be impressed with the fact that it's a wealthy church. I've known some churches like that, maybe had a lot of uh, heavy hitters and maybe some wealthy businessmen and had ability to do huge projects and so forth. And they say, boy, that is a wealthy church. That isn't necessarily a, uh, a bad thing, but it isn't necessarily good either. It may be that you go into church and maybe this is even more productive and to be known as a friendly church. Boy, I went to that church. Everybody was nice to me. That's a friendly church. Some people might say, well, I went to that church 
And boy, that was a lively church. I was a member. I wasn't a member, but I attended in college. I kept my membership back at my home church. But the, I attended the first couple of years I was in college, a church that I would call a lively church. The first service I was in, I'm listening to the music, enjoying the service, and a guy was sitting here on the front row, he took off on a sprint all the way across the auditorium and all the way back, and he sat down. I thought, man, boy, I've never seen that before. I kept listening to the music. In a few minutes, a guy jumped up, threw his hand in the air, ran up to the platform, grabbed a plant just like this one right here, and ran all the way around the whole auditorium, come back and sat it down. I'm looking around at all the people, and they just listened to the song. It didn't affect them whatsoever. Happens all the time. Now, I came up with the idea that was a lively church. Now, you can be classified as a wealthy church, or you could say we're a friendly church. You could say you're a lively church. None of those certainly are necessarily bad, and by themselves is not the goal. But what Paul is reminded here about this church is, I would say, made it the best church in town. You know, frankly, I'd like to be the best church in town. And I believe if you can have this badge and if you can have this title, it would make you the best church in town. Now, would to God, there were numerous churches like this in town, not saying there's not. But this is our goal as a church. If we want to be the best church in town, do you know what kind of church this was? It was a faithful church. Do you know God requires in stewards that we be faithful? Paul looked back at this church and certainly did not classify it as a perfect church. I hate to let you in on it. But there isn't one. If if there is, please don't join it. Leave a good thing alone. Okay, you'll surely mess it up. It wasn't a perfect church. It had issues. Every church does because the church, in a sense, is like a hospital to help people with needs. But yet, it was a faithful church. And I see several characteristics here that I think really any church can very simply implement and be that church that God would have it be. You know, the first thing I note, is the foundation of a faithful church. What does it rest on? Look back in verse 13 very carefully. It says, For this cause also think we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. The foundation of a faithful church is the word of God. I mean, he remembered when these people heard the word, and again, Paul was an apostle. The New Testament was not complete. He was there under the authority of Jesus who said, I have many things to show unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth was coming, I will guide you into all truth. And he had given it to his apostles, and these apostles would share it verbally. And then, of course, God uh, inspired his word very perfectly down in written language. But Paul was there, and he was giving them the truth, and they recognized this isn't man's opinion. You see, if a church is to be faithful, it has to have the right foundation. Now, the church's true foundation is Jesus Christ, the Lord. He is the living word. But the only thing that I know about the living word today is what's in the written word. The way I put Jesus first is I exalt the word of God. Now, you know what they did with the word of God, obviously, is they recognized its authority. They recognized that what Paul said was not just Paul saying, this is the way I think it ought to be. But they recognized, as it is in truth, the Word of God. Do you know today we must recognize that this book is not just man's opinion. It's not just religious uh, jargon from years gone by. It's not just a collection of traditions. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 89, thy word is forever settled in heaven. You see, it is a book that's been around from all eternity. It is a book that gives us a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I'd say, frankly, if you've got something that lasts longer than heaven and earth, you've got a pretty good foundation to build on. So understand, they recognized this book was not just a way to run things. It wasn't a religious prayer book. It is the word of the living God. Now, they not only recognized its authority, but I believe they remembered The impact of the Word of God. Now, Paul had gone in and had gone to a place where there was no gospel. I mean, again, Jesus had only risen from the dead just a short time before, so everything is new. They're going into an area that never before had been exposed to the gospel. Paul goes in, begins to preach, and what happens? Lives 
begin to get changed. Now, this was an idolatrous place. It wasn't unusual in that day. Most Gentiles were heavy idolaters. But when he went in, he reminds himself. In fact, in chapter 1, he goes off and reminds these believers. He said, how you turn to God from idols. Now, they had their idols. Now, we don't necessarily today have our streets lined with altars and, and different types of uh, uh, statues and so forth that people uh, attribute to gods and so forth. But people still have their gods. And do you know the gospel will still rescue, uh, rescue you from the wrong God? Some people's God today is their money. They are totally focused on what they can make, how much they can get, how much they can put away, how many toys they can buy, how much power it might give them. Yes, money is a necessary part of life. You've got to pay bills. You've got to eat. You've got to take care of things. Certainly, inflation gets people's attention, all of that. But when a person is utterly focused on money, that money can be their God. The Bible says covetousness, which is idolatry. Others, perhaps, are not as focused on money. Maybe they're focused on immorality. Do you know there's a God of immorality today that people focus on? It seems that their life is wrapped up with it. They're totally focused on it in Hollywood, in, the, in every uh, type of uh, uh, internet type of focus. I mean, you can't hardly escape it because people make a God out of the immoral lifestyle. Maybe alcohol is your God today. Somebody puts the bottle above everything else and it controls their life. Oh boy, I could just quit anytime I want. Well, why is it controlling you and destroying you? Now, the Lord Jesus has given us this book that will tell you how you can be delivered. It isn't turning over a new leaf. It isn't just deciding to do better. It isn't just living a good life. But the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, get it, by the word of God. Paul took the Bible into this place and he says, hey guys, remember when I came in and preached the Bible, when I left, the place wasn't the same. Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 29, he asked the question, Is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? I've mentioned this story probably before because it was really impacting to me when I was a, just in college. I was working in a grocery store as a Christian man that owned the store. He would play Christian radio over the speaker, like most people play the uh, ASCAP or whatever that stuff is, the elevator music. He would play a Christian radio station. And sometimes he'd actually put in cassettes and things. Well, one night it was Saturday night. Things were a little slow in the store. And he stuck in a sermon. He knew I liked it, and so he did it for my sake. But he put in a sermon by evangelist Oliver B. Green. Now, it was an old tent sermon. I mean, when he was, I mean, laying it out, laying it on the line, straight down the line. I mean, hellfire and brimstone, uh, hell's hot, heaven's beautiful, uh, sin's black, and Jesus saves. I mean, it was just a really good sermon. Um, I wish he'd preach it here, but he's dead. But anyway, uh, he had it on the radio, and it wasn't blasting, but it was in the background. I think I was stocking some shelves, working and so forth. The, the owner of the store was up there. There was one other person working, the cashier. Very few customers in the store. But I started walking up toward the front and finished what I was doing, putting away some boxes. And I looked and the cashier was up in the office. And you've seen these grocery store offices where you can see the people up in the top office. He's up in the office. The girl's got her head bowed. He's got his head bowed and they're praying. I thought, well, that's, I guess maybe, you know, something took place. And so he came down and told me, he said, she was listening to that sermon and she came to me and said she needed to get saved. <laughs> now you understand the word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. I mean, this book is dynamite. This book changes lives. Look, you don't have to be uh, overly convincing with logic. You don't have to have a silver tongue. You don't have to have some kind of a special ability. You take this book and you give it in your own limited way and let the Spirit of God move and it'll change people's lives. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. So they recognized it had authority. They remembered the impact. But here's what Paul was telling them. He said, I thank God when you heard it. You didn't receive it like the word of men. But as it is in truth the word of God, now get this, which effectually worketh in the heart of those who believe. You know, this is not just here as information. The Bible has much information in it. Don't get me wrong. It is not just here to inform this book effectually works in the heart of those who believe. 
You know, we often think about what I talked about just a minute ago. Boy, that's right. Somebody's lost, and they hear the Bible. God will convict their heart, and they'll respond. And he does. God, it's like a sharp, two-edged sword. But for the believer, the Word isn't just there to inform you. It effectually works in your heart. You know, the very oldest book in the Bible, Job. Job going through great trial and difficulty. Went through some tremendous uh, deep waters. And we know that story. Even people that don't know much about the Bible have heard of Job and how he was tried. But in chapter 23 and verse 12 of that book, he told God, he said, I esteem the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. You know, as much as he's going through that deep trial, where would I be if God didn't give me some of his words? Now, he didn't have all we got. But he said, I esteem the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. You know, the Bible speaks of itself as food. The Bible reminds us over in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus went through the, uh, the wilderness and the devil tried to tempt him there. And he reminds him of the old quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You know, if we love this book as much as we love food, I wonder what it would do to us. I mean, when I look forward, I have to admit to you now, I look forward when it's time to eat. Sometimes I look forward in between the time to eat. But God uses that illustration because we all can relate to it. We all know what it's like. In fact, lose your appetite sometimes. That's strange, isn't it? That's unusual. We don't like that to lose our appetite. But oh, how detrimental if we ever lose our appetite for the Word of God. Because it changes lives. You know, it also speaks of itself as great spoil. Psalm 119, 165, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. You know, uh, over in Psalm 19, with that great psalm about the word of God, and he goes down and he says that the word of God, the words of thy mouth, are better than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned. You see, it effectually works in our heart. You know, this book, if I'm in it, and I meditate in it, and I read it, and I let it permeate my soul, Paul says, you know what it'll do? It'll effectually work in your life. You know, every Christian ought to be exposed consistently to God's Word. Now listen, we're not so-called monks who spend six hours a day uh, carefully reading the Bible. Evidently, they don't learn much from it because they don't follow what it says. It's not a matter of how much time. Time matters now. Don't get me wrong how you spend it. But taking the word of God and making it real to your life. James chapter 1 verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. There's some folks that can quote it and know what it's all about. I've I've witnessed to folks that didn't even go to church. I would even question that they were saved. And they could quote more than some Baptist I know. They, They were familiar with it. Usually the passage just to prove their point why they were okay. But the fact is, we ought to be doers and not hearers only. Now, we ought to be hearers, but we ought to be doers and hearers. He says, if anybody be a doer and not a hearer, he is likened to a man that beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For straightway he goeth away and forgetteth what manner of man he was. He says, to be a hearer of the word and not a doer is like walking up to the mirror and saying, whoa, boy, that's a lot of work. I mean, my hair needs comb, I need shaved, I ought to wash my face. Man, that's rough. i tell you how I'm going to fix this. Turn the mirror around. Now it looks fine. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Well, that's as ridiculous as looking into this book saying, boy, there's some habits that need to go. There's some things that God's displeased with. Boy, I'm not obeying this book. I know how to do it. Close it and don't listen to it. You know, every Christian ought to be exposed to the preaching of the Word of God. Do you know God ordained preaching to save them that believe. He also ordained preaching to challenge us as believers. You know, uh, Timothy was told to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Well, you know, we're out of season right now, but we're going to keep preaching. In season might be a time that's unusual because most of the time the world doesn't want it. He said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves preachers having itching ears. See, we preach the word because we can rebuke and we can exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We can help. It'll challenge every Christian ought to hear preaching. But you know, every Christian ought to have a personal devotional life. It's one thing to come in on Sunday and listen to preaching and say, boy, that's good. That's challenging. That's helpful. I've seen the mirror, but now 
I'm like the man that looked at his face in the mirror. If I just walk away, I believe I'll be okay. But if throughout the week, you go back and renew what God's shown you, you find a place in this book and just start meditating on it. Uh, some of us can take more in at a time. Some of us have more time to put into it. We're not even putting a time limit on it. But what are you doing when you read this book? You're not just trying to become informed so you can speak intelligently. You ought to be seeking God. There's only one place to find Him. You find Him when you go to this book. So to, to have a foundation that is proper for a faithful church, the Word of God is that foundation. Now that's greatly encouraging. These people were thinking, boy, that's right, Paul. Man, we've got the Word of God and we're going to move forward. And wouldn't it be wonderful today if we could simply, in a simplistic way, say, well, you know what? We're all fired up today about God's Word. We're going to grow. We're going to be challenged. We're going to go out in the world and I'm going to stop at the store today and I'm going to give out a gospel track and everybody who gets one, they'll be in church next Sunday. Well, no, it doesn't always work that way. Don't get me wrong. There's profit in those gospel tracks. They sow the seed. There's people in this service today, I can assure you, say, yeah, I, I was given a gospel track and heard about Christ. Yes, they do a wonderful job, but why, why isn't it that simple? Because not only is there a foundation, but he also mentions there's a foe. We have an enemy. Look, if you would, in verse 14. He says, you became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea, in Christ Jesus, you've also suffered like things of your own countrymen even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Here's what they did to them. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Now, when you think of the foe, you know that there is going to be opposition. All you need do is look today and say, well, look, here's a, here's a law that was passed. It's been, uh, I guess you could call it controversial. People are certainly divided about it. The Roe v. Wade decisions took place. Now, for whatever, uh, 50 years, uh, the other side spent, we don't believe this. It's wrong. We ought not be doing this. Now it's flipped around and we say, well, thank God. Well, you know, they didn't call up the politicians and say, why did you change this? They, have yes, criticized the Supreme Court and so forth. But do you know where they show up? Religious organizations. Now, that's because they're aiming this, hey, God's behind this thing. Now, some of the places they're showing up, God probably isn't there either. But in their mind, they think God's responsible for it. You understand, we are today, just like those Thessalonians, going to face an opposition because really, it is not the people, it's who's behind those people. They're just pawns. You'll notice he says in verse 14, uh, concerning the brethren and the countrymen, Killed the Lord Jesus and then forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Now the devil was doing it, but he has some pawns. You know what Jesus told us right before he left? He said it to his disciples for our exhortation. Uh, John 16, In the world you shall have tribulation. Can we attest to that? That we have tribulation in this world? Now, you're going to have trials. Trials and difficulty that God allows to take place, that's, a, that's something else. That's true too. But do we not face in this world tribulation? I remember reading a little story. Of, I think it was on the news just for a short time, and it's not unusual. In one of these uh, states, I dare say I don't think this would happen in South Carolina, but it certainly could. But a little kid, sixth grade, simply took his Bible to school, laid it on top of his books, put it down beside his desk. It sat there. Obviously, if he had some free time, his intention would be to read it. But that wasn't even the controversy. He had it at school. Well, man, the teacher saw that thing. She goes to the principal. The principal, of course, stops it. The parents oppose it. They go to the school board. They take it to court. All over a little sixth grade boy bringing a Bible to school. Hey, yes, in the world, you are going to have tribulation. But the rest of the verse says, I have overcome the world. Do you think tribulation is going to stop Jesus? I mean, is it going to stop what he's doing? You say, why is it a tribulation? You understand this world that we live in, this realm, is the devil's world. You say, well, I thought God owned it. The earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof. And God is going to take back over and set up a kingdom in this world. But this aura, this... Look, if God was running this place, you think it would look like this? No, this isn't God's world system. The system is the devil's. 
I mean, Adam lost out when he sinned and it brought in this old evil system and we're full of sinners. All of us come into this world as sinners and without Jesus, we're going to stay that way until we put our trust in Him and have our sin taken away. Even then, we live in a sinful world and we keep this old sinful flesh until we go to be with Him. The world has some evil in it and His pawns are going to stop. So when we say, well, you know what? There's a devil's world full of lost people. They're going to hell. I'd sure like to do something about it. And we take the powerful Word of God like a sword and say, well, I'm just going to walk in there and start trying to win sinners. That's like pouring salt on a slug. You're going to stir the devil up. It's like trying to say, I'm going to knock down that wasp nest. When you knock it down, you better knock it down good. Don't just stir them up. I mean, put it down. You say, well, we walk in and boy, we caused a hornet's nest. Is that going to end us? Well, that's what Jesus meant. When he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. The devil's trying his best to shut you out. But he says, the church, as long as it's here till Jesus comes, is going to make some inroads. I want to be part of that. I want to be in that march. I want this church to be faithful, to say our job, though we have opposition, is to move into that arena. So he has pawns. He also has a purpose. What's his purpose? Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. Why? Why does the devil care if we speak to the Gentiles? Why does he really care if we take a Bible to church? Why does he care if I want to set up something in a, uh, at an Isaiah a festival? Or what, why does he care if I want to put a sign out on the road or maybe send out mailers or even go pass out something in a neighborhood, which sometimes we try to, people try to run us off? Why? It's very simple. The devil, it answers the question right here, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. If there's one thing the devil doesn't want you to do, is to be saved. Now, he demonstrates that in numerous ways. First of all, he tries to stop the gospel. You know, the Bible in this same chapter here is going to say, pray that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. The devil can hinder the course. He can't stop it because the Bible also says the word of God is not bound. So by prayer, we can remove some of those obstacles, but what is the devil trying to do to keep the gospel from going to lost people? Now think about it this morning. If you're here, you may be religious. You could be a member of a church. You could have a church background. You can understand Jesus died. You've heard about him rising again. But do you know that you've been born again? The devil can come and say, well, yeah, I know you ought to be born again. He doesn't care if you, care if you think you will be. He just don't want you to do it today. Proverbs 29.1, he that being often reproved, that means God's spoken to you again and again, and each time one day, I'll think about it, let me consider it, next Sunday, maybe when I'm older, he that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. 2 Corinthians 6.2, the Bible says that in um, the day of salvation have I succored thee, behold, now is the day of salvation. See, the devil is a liar. He comes and he whispers in the ear of the person who the Spirit of God is convicting and says, just wait a little longer. He doesn't come to you and say, give up on God, turn from the Bible, it's none, nothing to this stuff. He's not powerful enough to convince most people of that. He just says, put it off. Or you don't need it. You're not as bad as that preacher says. Are we really? We're worse. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what the devil would love to do is simply desire, and his whole goal is to see you in hell for all eternity. He knows he'll be there, and the best thing he can do is just bring dishonor to God to try to get as many folks as he can to go with him. Do you know what God has set up to keep those people from going to hell? Is his church with the message of the gospel. And you know what? The devil trembles at the message of the gospel. When a believer gets on his knees and says, God, give the word of God free course and let it be glorified, the devil, oh, man, what can I do to get that believer off his knees? When somebody gets burdened for their neighbor and says, boy, I really ought to invite them to church, or I, I ought to ask them if they're saved, he'll do everything he can to talk you out of it. And if he can, he'll move his pawns, the government, officials, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, he'll try to get to move them in your way as well. But I'm encouraged to know that he's already lost. He's a defeated foe. No man can enter into a strong man's house except he first bind the strong man. Jesus bound the strong man. We can head into his house, 
We've got the authority. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. We can go. So there's a foe to the church. Paul says there's a foundation. There's a foe. But then I notice lastly, the future of a faithful church. See, we know the end of the story. He says in verse 17, But we, brethren, being taken for you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, I, Paul, once again, but here it is, but Satan hindered us. You know, sometimes Satan does get in the way. He's a foe. But even though that be the case, but what is our hope or our joy, our crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. For ye are our glory and joy. You know, the believer and the faithful church has something to look forward to. God can give something that the devil can't give the world. God can give you something that, that lost people can't even understand. The world couldn't even imagine. You mean to tell me you're up against opposition and difficulty and Satan even hindered you? And what is our joy and our hope? You know what Paul says his hope and joy is? What's the focus? He says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? Who is the ye? Folks, he had won to Christ. You know what the joy of a church is? Is to realize in spite of the opposition, in spite of the difficulty, in spite of what they're up against, we're seeing people saved. You know, I don't even know sometimes, we know it in our, in our head, and I'm sure I'm the same way, the impact of a soul coming to Christ. You know what Jesus says happens in heaven when one sinner repents? Heaven, the redeemed people of heaven, in the presence of the angels, erupt in joy. I mean, nothing else on this earth moves heaven. I'll guarantee you, heaven isn't worried about inflation or the gas prices. Heaven is not moved by who's going to win the presidency in the United States or in the EU or anywhere else. Heaven's not moved by that. Now, God is obviously concerned with everything in our life. There's a lot going on. I'd hate to think I was up in heaven and wondering how the election was going to turn out. Okay, you worry about it down here some, but up in heaven, I'm, I'm confident. Uh, would you even look forward to going if you had to think about that for eternity? They're not worried about it, but there's one thing that stirs them. There's one thing that moves them. Somebody just came to Jesus. Now, it might be somebody you prayed for for years, didn't even know about it till you got to heaven. It might be some stranger, but it says heaven erupts. Now, Paul says, what is our joy or crown of rejoicing? Well, you know, the believer has crowns that they look forward to. There's future crowns. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says uh, the, the athlete is laboring and works for a trophy, right? A, a, and to them, the trophy was a little crown. He says they do it for a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. An incorruptible crown that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. The crown's a word. It's just God uses that word because we can't imagine what it is. It's not that when I get to heaven, I want a piece of uh, uh, ivy sitting on top of my head. That wasn't the point. That was a word they grasped because it was what that crown stood for. It stood for, well done. You did the job. You were faithful. Now that's the incorruptible crown. You say, boy, I sure, I sure look forward to that. I can't wait till I get to heaven and I see that crown. Let me tell you something else. In fact, I want you to turn here, if you would, to James chapter 1, real quickly on this thought, because this crown is so significant. Now, I'm going to depart a little bit from the standard thought here. We're often told there's five crowns that we can look forward to when we get to heaven. One of those, of course, is the incorruptible crown. Well, we therefore so run that we may obtain. So it is a future we may obtain. We have the crown that Paul said, there is laid up for me, henceforth laid up for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give. That's future. We know that uh, the, the uh, crown that we just mentioned in 1 Thessalonians, you are our crown of rejoicing, which the Lord at his coming. So that's yet future. But then one of the crowns is right here, and people often struggle with this, but I want you to notice the careful wording of the Bible. I'm going to depart a little bit from the standard thought, but notice what it says. In verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. 
Now, that's not talking about temptation to sin, but it's trials. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, I contend that that crown you can have right now. It's not eternal life. You don't get that by enduring temptation. You get eternal life by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. People often struggle with this. They come to this and they think, well, the crown of life. I already have eternal life. But you know, Jesus promised more than just life that didn't end, right? When do you get eternal life? The very moment you come to Christ. You're given that life. It says now, blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried. Now you're not going to receive the life, but the crown of it. I don't want to take time because it'll take us time to go back and forth. But you study sometimes John chapter 14. When Jesus says, he that hath my words and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. And my father, I and my father will come and make up our abode with him. He gives a special promise to the one who loves him with evidence in the, in the keeping of the word of God. And I believe this crown of life, this, this God saying, well done, is actually a crown right now. You go through the struggle. You go through the difficulty. You stay faithful. And you know what God will do? The crown's not something for somebody else to look at. The crown is something he gives you right in here. A well done in your heart to say, I'm with you. I'm watching over you. You know, you can be in the midst of the trial. When you endure it, God says, I'm going to put my arms around you, my father and I, and we're going to come and make up our abode with you. You know, I want to be a faithful church because you know what we need? We need that individually. But what do we need in this church? And I don't say this to be sensational. You know what I mean. We need the presence of God. If he's in here, sinners are going to see their need. If he's moving... Christians are going to have a pliable heart. If he's working, we're going to love one another as Christ loved us. If he's moving, he's going to root out sin. If his presence is here, there's going to be, uh, it's going to be unpopular to be contentious. I mean, if he's moving, there's not going to be a lot of gossip that it's not, I mean, the Spirit of God is going to deal with it. We need his presence, a pliable heart, a faithful church. So what is that faithful church going to do? Well, again, the crown of rejoicing. If you have the passage, you can turn back. If not, just listen carefully. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Or not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. There's no other way to talk about it. A faithful church that God's honoring, that God's using, that the joy is expressed is not because we have a great special. We had one this morning. My heart was stirred. I enjoyed it. It's not because there's... Uh, just mere biblical preaching. By the grace of God, we have biblical preaching. Okay, there's, there's something here that God is looking for that he says gives the joy, the ultimate goal. And obviously it's going to happen because you have the right kind of spiritual music and the right kind of preaching and the right kind of atmosphere and folks are walking with God. But what is the crown of rejoicing? It is souls coming to Christ. Jesus said, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. I remember a, I could, multiple stories. This one just, I thought about this morning when I was putting this finishing touch here. A lady who came, person, I don't even remember who invited her, but she was in the real estate uh, realm. How many real estate agents we got this morning? Amen? I mean, right, a bunch. Okay. Some real estate agent invited another real estate agent. Said, hey, why don't you come to church? Well, this particular one had a church background, um, not a sound background, but some kind of religious background and said, well, yeah, sure. I hadn't been in church yet. I think I'll go try a new one. And she came and she liked it and stuck a while, but about three or four weeks into it or some amount of time, she met with me and she said, look, I've got a religious background. I've gone to this type of church, but you know, I've been listening here every week and listening to what you preach. And I'll tell you, I just don't really believe that I'm saved. Well, I just took out the Bible explained to her what the gospel was, and sure enough, she wasn't saved. She was religious. She trusted Christ. Immediately, I saw joy on her face, but again, what was more important than that? Of course, we baptized her. She went on and began to live for the Lord and began to produce fruit. Now, this wasn't an isolated incident. Again, in the right kind of church, you're seeing this kind of take place, but every individual is important. 
And I just recall this lady, and she ended up uh, moving to a different area and going off in a different way. But what is our crown of rejoicing? It's not the money in the bank account. It's not the imp uh, being impressive in the community. It's not prestige. Our crown of rejoicing is that we impact lives for Jesus Christ that are saved by the grace of God and become part of his family, headed to heaven, and then go on to produce fruit themselves. May God make us a faithful church. Let's have a word of prayer.